Everywhere you look these days, people are taking photographs with their tablets, laptops, digital cameras, and mostly their phones. It used to be that taking photos was saved for special events, and the call to say cheese was heard mainly during the holidays or on a family vacation. With pictures instantly available on a digital device and posted on the internet instantly, the need for film and processing has moved from the mainstream into the niche market of artists and hobbyists. It wasn't that long ago, however, that the desire for instant photography led a young inventor to create a camera and film technology that would satisfy that need for speed. His name was Edwin Land, and his company was Polaroid. It turns out that Edwin Land was the father of the technology, the founder of Polaroid, and the more I learned about him, the more amazed I was that he was this unbelievably important American inventor and technologist, and so few people, including myself, had ever heard of him. That's Ron Fierstein, and he wanted the world to hear about the amazing man and his groundbreaking inventions. So he wrote about them in his book, a Triumph of Genius, Edwin Land, Polaroid, and the Kodak Patent War. It was that patent war that first brought Land's accomplishments to the author's attention. When I was a young lawyer, I was on a team of lawyers at a New York law firm called Fish and Neve that represented Polaroid. And they were representing Polaroid in a major intellectual property battle with Eastman Kodak over the technology involved in instant photography or one-step photography. We're all familiar with Polaroid cameras and the way that they would shoot out a picture and you'd have a print in your hand within a minute or so. Well, this is a major battle, and I didn't realize until I got involved in that that when you looked at a Polaroid camera and it said Polaroid Land Camera, I didn't know that land referred to a person. I always thought it referred to the ground, like they were trying to distinguish that camera from an aerial camera or an underwater camera. Edwin Land was born in Connecticut in 1909 and, as a child, had an insatiable curiosity about light and how it was manipulated in devices such as stereoscopes and kaleidoscopes. Fierstein says that Land had one special interest as a teenager, and that was finding a way to remove the glare from automobile headlights, a big safety problem back in the 1930s. So Land abandoned a traditional education to strike out on his own. He got obsessed with the issue of polarized light. Polarized light is merely the ability of some substances to take the glare out of bright light, and physicists had observed this phenomenon back in the 17th century. And people could think of all kinds of practical uses. Gee, if we had something that could do that, we could take the glare out of automobile headlights, or we could take the glare out of the light in terms of glasses and so on. But no one could come up with a practical material for hundreds of years. But Land solved that when he was 19 years old and dropped out of Harvard to commercialize it. He found a way to create a very thin sheet of plastic that could polarize light. By the time he was 25, he had the equivalent of a $250 million company selling his polarized sheet. But what about the instant pictures, the technology that Polaroid and Land are most remembered for? Fierstein says that in the beginning of his book, there's a charming incident that brought the idea to Land's attention, but he's not going to reveal it here. He will say, however, that it came from the desire for instant gratification that in the 1940s was not a hallmark of photography. Back in those days, it could take two or three weeks to see your prints once you shot a roll of film because it had to be processed, sent off to a laboratory and so on and so forth. And, and all of a sudden it dawned on him that maybe this was something to attack and to try and solve, to give people a print in their hands shortly after they snapped the shutter. So he became obsessed with that, like other issues, and that was 1943. And by 1947, four years later, he was in a position to demonstrate his new process, which he did in New York City at the meeting of the American Optical Society. And it was in the stores a year later in 1948. That's where the Polaroid-Kodak partnership started. Fierstein says that the two companies had a symbiotic relationship that lasted for decades and helped make both of them a lot of money. As long as the Polaroid instant camera was ejecting photos with all of the paper, the waiting time, and the sticky coating that the earlier models required, everything went well. But when Land came out with the new, truly instant camera in the early 70s, things between the two companies went south. 
They went from being mentor protege to arch enemies over this course of time. And Kodak, of course, was Polaroid's first customer for its polarized material. Kodak turned it into camera filters. And when Land decided to start his experiments in photography, he went to his colleagues at Kodak and they gave him all the materials he needed, chemicals, paper, all that stuff, even though they had no idea what he was up to. And when he came up with his first system, he went back to Kodak and asked them to manufacture the negatives because it's a very complicated thing to do. And so Kodak actually manufactured every Polaroid negative right from the beginning well into the 60s for more than 20 years. Well, all of that changed when Land showed them the prototype for SX-70, which was the first one that would come out of the camera and develop with no manipulation, no garbage left over, nothing. For the first time, Kodak said, you know, wow, this might impact our dominance of the amateur photography market. So Polaroid, yeah, we'll help you with this one, but only if you let us make some of this film and sell it in our own trademark yellow boxes. Polaroid wouldn't accept that deal, and the two companies broke off their relationship. Fierstein says that when Polaroid was figuring out how to make the film it needed, Kodak was trying to develop its own system. When Kodak finally came out with its competitive system in 1976, of course it turned out that they utilized some of Polaroid's technology without a license, without permission. And so Polaroid, the former protege, had to sue its mentor for patent infringement. And out of that came one of the most important intellectual property battles in American history. The case took place in Boston Federal Court, and there was a lot of interest there since Polaroid Corporation was a Boston institution. But the media picked up on it, and the lawsuit, which charged that Kodak had violated 10 of Polaroid's patents, made national headlines. One of the high points in the case was when the private and reclusive Edwin Land took the stand to testify. Fight as they may and try as they may, the Kodak lawyers were never able to shake him, and he gave very dramatic testimony that at the end of the day really helped Polaroid win the case. Fierstein says that Land continued his inventing, and when he died in 1991, was second only to Thomas Edison in the number of patents he owned. After retiring from Polaroid, Land continued his obsession with research and created the Roland Institute, which is now part of Harvard University. What he wanted to do is create a place where scientists could do pure research, that is, research on something interesting without having a predetermined idea of how it could be exploited or how you could make money on it. He just was always interested in pure research. So using his own money, set up an institution a beautiful institution, architecturally and so on, to really nurture scientists doing pure research. And he worked there for the rest of his life, and that institution continues in his name. You can learn more about Edwin Land and his legacy in Ron Fierstein's book, A Triumph of Genius, Edwin Land, Polaroid, and the Kodak Patent War, available on Amazon.com. For information about all of our guests and past shows, visit viewpointsradio.org. And to get more behind the scenes, check out Viewpoints Radio on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. This segment originally aired in September 2017 and was written by Evan Rook. Studio production by Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Viewpoints returns in just a moment. Detecting the brain changes of Alzheimer's disease before symptoms appear can be done today only through expensive PET scans or spinal fluid tests. But researchers are homing in on a simple, inexpensive blood test that might spot changes up to 20 years before symptoms appear. Multiple studies presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference 2020 show that specific proteins are detectable in the blood as early as age 25 that correspond to the buildup of toxic tangles in the brain. Dr. Maria Carrillo is Chief Science Officer of the Alzheimer's Association. These are early results, but they are encouraging. There is an urgent need for simple, inexpensive, and non-invasive diagnostic tools for Alzheimer's. An early blood test would allow people with Alzheimer's and those at risk to plan for the future, and it could speed drug development by identifying the right people for clinical trials. Dr. Carrillo says the tests require further large-scale studies before they can be made widely available. Find out more at ALZ.org. 
And that's Viewpoints for this week. Viewpoints is a production of MediaTracks Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Coming up next week... My parents, like so many Holocaust survivors, didn't really start talking about their experiences until maybe 50 years later. The untold stories of the Holocaust. Then... If you get an email from Winnie Mandela, that's not a bad day, is it? That's a fun thing to happen. One man's mission to scam the scammers. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints.